Today, a fun video. I'll share an exercise that Raymond and I did when trying to figure out what camera to sell after having purchased several bodies in the last year, most recently, the Nikon Z50. Inevitably, comparisons are gonna be made between the new to market Nikon Z50 mirrorless interchangeable lens camera and the trusty flagship of Nikon's DX DSLRs, the venerable G500. I have had viewers ask me about the comparison and I drew some of my own comparisons in my review of the Z50 last week. I will link to that review in the description, but in the review, I said that our Z6 was no longer on the chopping block, which is what we thought we were going to sell when we bought the Z50, but now we think it's the D500 that will be headed out the door. We aren't saying that the Z50 and the D500 are necessarily comparable bodies for everyone, but we did say that they kind of fit into the same slot for us. And unfortunately, it's time to make some tough decisions and get rid of some cameras. Before we move on to the challenge of choosing favorites amongst my cameras, a quick announcement. I have announced my next photography tour. It is to Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks. It is coming up very soon in May of 2020. I will put a link up above and in the description to where you can learn more about it. There was actually an error in pricing that we have corrected, so you may want to recheck the page even if you've already looked at it. I hope you can join us. When we looked at our lineup of camera bodies with an eye to have bodies that cover all of the bases. We want to be able to pick out a camera and go out and shoot anything and enjoy it. We saw that the D500 has been sitting on the shelf unused for quite a while. And we purchased this and reviewed it nearly four years ago. And it used to serve the place as an everyday shooter, but also our key body for action and wildlife. Up until about a year ago, I wouldn't have dreamed of picking up any of my other bodies for that type of work. But we purchased some incredibly capable bodies in the last year and add in that I don't have a lot of room for a camera that doesn't have the video capabilities that I often need for my work. Namely, quiet continuous autofocus and face detect during video. And so sadly, the D500 became the camera that we thought we might sell. However, we went on an outing with it and the Z50 to see how they really do compare on a typical shooting day. We also thought it would be a fun exercise to think about how the specifications compare. And somewhere along the way, I will address how the other cameras that we own fit into our lineup. Before I begin this, I want to make clear that the D500 is a great camera. If you have one and you love it, it's probably all you need. We still do love it for fast action and the flexibility that it offers when trying to keep up with pro sports, little league or anything in between. But as much as we would like to, we just can't keep all of the cameras. And we have found that it is the D500 that gets left behind when we head out with our cameras. It's all about my work and the way we shoot. Everyone has their own preferences. So this test between the D500 and the Z50 was an informal, non-scientific test. We outfitted the D500 with the 35 millimeter f1.8 DX prime lens, an F-mount lens, and then the Z50 with the 35 millimeter f1.8 S, a full frame Z-mount lens. We roamed the Phoenix Art Museum independently, but we also took some of the same shots with both setups and even interpreted some of the same objects differently, just to give you a, an idea of how the two different cameras see the world, but also to do a, a real life comparison to see how we each enjoyed using the two cameras and how they did, technically speaking. The takeaway was that both DX cameras are competent and capable. That's not really a surprise though. The biggest difference was in terms of use of the camera and it's a good example of how much personal preference plays into which camera is best for any given photographer and how those preferences can change over time. Let's dive into some technical differences. While the D500 is a DX legend, the Z50 is no slouch. It checks in at 11 frames per second. The D500 can come close to that, especially when using a speedy XQD card. 
the difference with the D500 and the pro-level full-frame action-oriented Nikon DSLRs has always been not just their frames per second, but the ability to acquire focus instantly, quickly raise the mirror, fire the shutter, and then get the mirror back down, as well as the buffer. And we will get to the buffer in a minute, but let's discuss the responsiveness of acquiring focus and taking the photo first. We noted with our Z6 and Z7 that they do this very well without the extra steps for the mirror. And then we put the Z50 through the paces and we found the focus performance to be indistinguishable from the Z6 and Z7. The only slight problems occurred when we were using the kit lens on the Z50, which is forced to shoot at a smaller aperture when zooming, f6.3 at 50 millimeters. Remember when using a variable aperture lens like that, the camera has to do all of its metering and focusing at that base aperture for the focal length. Whereas with an f2.8 zoom, you may be shooting at f6.3, but the camera can use the additional light to set up the shot at f2.8 and then adjust to your desired aperture while shooting. What this means is that some of what holds the Z50 back are the lenses that are typically used with it. I mentioned this in my review. The D500 user may have more wide aperture zooms and primes in their bag, ensuring that the camera can perform at peak effectiveness. When we used these more expensive lenses on our Z50, it was very responsive. So in terms of that responsiveness and general snappiness, both cameras did very well. Let's dig in on some, but certainly not all of the differences between these two great DX cameras. Both can produce excellent results in either experienced or novice to intermediate hands. The Z50 is simpler, while the D500 has more options overall, but especially when it comes to dynamic area autofocus and tracking, neither Raymond or I ever fell in love with the 3D tracking on the D500, but it is an option that the Z50 does not have. And I know that there are a number of you out there that expressed that you like it. The D500 also has multiple configurations for Raymond's and my favorite focusing mode for action, dynamic area. While the Z50 does have dynamic area mode, but without the choices for the number of focus areas. That isn't really an issue for us, but it might be for you. Now the Z50 does have object tracking. You have to be in auto area and then click the OK button to start tracking the object, but these are the benefits of mirrorless coming to fruition in that viewfinder data can be observed and processed by the camera. While with the D500, the only time the camera can real-time process what you'd see on the screen is in live view mode, which I've never been a fan of for DSLRs. In fact, I'm not even willing to compare the D500's live view to the Z50's normal mirrorless operation because for me, Using the D500 or any DSLR in live view is simply an exercise in frustration, especially if I am shooting any sort of action. Here's a big difference between the two cameras. The D500 gets the buffer advantage with a much larger buffer, and it also has the overall speedier XQD card compatibility. The Z50 has a decent buffer, but not as good, and it uses a single UHS-1 SD card, which are slower, but they're of course everywhere. And yes, one card slot on Z50 and two on the D500. Raymond and I did a quick comparison between the two buffers. We set both cameras to 14-bit raw and continuous firing with the D500 writing to an XQD card in one of its two slots and the Z50 writing to an SD card in its single slot.
that's quite a difference, but I like to keep in mind the practicality of it. Do you need that deep a buffer? I almost never do. It's something fun to play with, but for me, it simply isn't necessary. Even when I shoot action and wildlife, I am much more mindful in the shots I'm capturing. It is an extremely rare occurrence when I fill a buffer. But there are a lot of folks out there that like to mash down that shutter release button and they enjoy seeing what happens. Speaking of fast action, there's no doubt that the D500's closest competitors for fast action photography are Nikon's own D5 with a nod to the D850 and really the Sony Alpha 7 R4, Alpha 9, and Alpha 9 II. Sony's Alpha 9 series are a showcase of what fast action and tracking can look like on a mirrorless camera. I do own the Alpha 7 R4, and here's another disclaimer. If you own something else and you shoot action and wildlife with it, that's great. I have not met a camera that I couldn't shoot action with, like the Z50. It isn't meant to be, you know, marketed for action, but it's no slouch. I rode back and forth on my mountain bike while Raymond tested it out, and we ended up with a ton of in-focus, usable photos. Continuing on with the idea of fast action, here at HQ, we have that Sony Alpha 7 R4, and we have an Icon Z6 and Z7, along with the Z50 and the D500. We have a full spectrum converted Nikon D810 and a couple of older Nikon DSLRs. And we have our eyes on a couple of newer options out there from different brands. We keep a lot of cameras and lenses handy to show you how they work. And frankly, because we just plain love cameras. We even have several film cameras hanging around for when I find the time to load some film into them. Mirrorless cameras do a good job of making DSLRs feel unnecessarily large and a bit hollow. Raymond and I both like the sleek feel of our mirrorless cameras. Even though he has giant sized hands and even my hands are large for my size, mirrorless bodies seem to, they just make our hands happy, which it counts for us. Even with a large lens, the small mirrorless bodies feel solid. And then picking up a DSLR afterwards, it just feels a bit cumbersome in comparison. Just looking at the Z50 and the D500, everything on the Z50 feels more compact, but also more tactile than the D500. I guess you could say that it feels just lean and mean. And again, for how I shoot and how much I shoot, the haptics matter. Now, there's a trade-off. Unlike the D500, there is no vertical grip for the Z50 that holds more batteries or expands the form factor and it does not share the battery with the D500, Z6, and Z7. The Z50 battery is smaller with less capacity. For most purposes, that's not a big deal for us, though it is kind of a bummer, but those things could be a deal breaker for a pro shooter. On top of the ergonomics of the D500 just not being enjoyable for me anymore, Raymond and I were laughing in the museum pretty much every time we would take photos next to each other. He was all stealth and quiet click as the photos taken with the Z50, but not me with the D500. The sound of a DSLR in a quiet museum is deafening. I don't actually mean deafening, but it was pretty loud. After having used primarily mirrorless cameras for the last year, I didn't like it. And something else, the viewfinder. We all used optical viewfinders forever. I never thought I would mind it. And I mean, electronic viewfinders were not so great for a very long time. But now that I'm using current generation electronic viewfinders, the immediate feedback on my finished product is invaluable. I've had more than one viewer get a little snooty about that, saying that using an electronic viewfinder is lazy. But I disagree. They are efficient. If you don't like it, though, that's cool. Go old school with an optical viewfinder. Okay, if Raymond and I could only have one camera and we were choosing between the Z50 and the D500, this would be a much more difficult decision. I've had many of you out there ask me which you should purchase or if you should switch to the Z50 from the D500. The D500 is that trusty gunslinger of a camera that will get the shot with your tried and true F-mount lenses every time, even in a thunderstorm. <laughs> while the Z50 
can use those F-mount lenses too with the FTZ adapter and the newer Z lenses. It's not as deep into professional sports functions, such as the variety of autofocus modes and other extras, like the D500's dual memory card slots, and it does not appear to have the extensive weatherproofing that the D500 has. Remember that the D500 lacks a pop-up flash, which helps a lot with weather sealing. But the Z50 seems to hold the future in its hands with video and autofocus detection options. It would be a tough choice for me and my work, but my situation might be unique from yours in that I do work with my camera in both photo and video. And because of that, I do own multiple camera bodies. Not to mention the fact that Raymond, my partner in crime, is also a photographer and working on this channel. So we wouldn't do well with just one camera body. Can you imagine? We'd have to like arm wrestle for the camera every time we went out. So here's what I am not telling you. I'm not telling you to change a thing. If you own a D500 or you're considering one and you feel that that's the camera for you, then it is, period. Don't let anyone else tell you otherwise. The D500 is as great a camera in 2020 as it was in 2016. It pains me to let it go almost as much as when I sold the D300S. Saying goodbye to that one was rough. If we were given the choice today for an all-around camera with the latest tech at a low price, the Z50 checks most of the boxes. It's not gonna to appeal to those exclusively looking for full frame, nor those that have decided that IBIS is a must have. You won't find IBIS on the Z50 or the D500. If you're looking for an icon that's tailor-made for sports and fast action, either at an amateur or professional level, the D500, the D5, the upcoming D6 are all great choices. If you want the absolute latest and best tech in mirrorless that is also extremely well suited for fast action and offers tremendous flexibility within those capabilities, well, we'll let you form your own judgment on that. But for us, the Sony Alpha 7 R4 fits the build nicely with a nod towards the Alpha 9 and Alpha 9 II. I have used the Alpha 9 and was absolutely blown away by the speed and responsiveness. This video is not about that though. It's not about which fast action camera you should purchase. This is really, this is just a part of the behind the scenes here in Snapchat land that I wanted to share. These are things that we discuss here. Hopefully I did not make things more confusing for you. We have our observations and you may have yours. Let me know down in the comments if you do. And of course, check out the tour linked below. I will also be reviewing the Sony Alpha 7 R4 soon, so make sure that you're subscribed and hit the bell so that you will receive notifications when I share new videos. And like this video if you enjoyed this kind of a thing. Thanks for watching.